From crunching the simplest odds to mastering the art of probability, buckle up as we share the most important keys of poker math every player needs to know. I'll take your money. I've never walked out of a poker tournament. Get ready to stack your chips and cash in big. Let's turn those numbers into dollars together. Building intuition. Now we know what you're thinking right now. Where does poker math enter into the equation? And the answer to this is simple. Just about every situation you may face at the poker table. Last time I want to hear it. The most basic concept is that poker math needs to influence your decisions on every hand. Whether it's pre-flop, the flop, the turn, or on the river, you should have a keen understanding of your hand's equity versus the range your opponent is likely playing. Let's take it an example so you get the point. Suppose the pot is $100 and your opponent bets $50, making the total pot of $150. This means you are getting 150. 50 on a call, which means three, one. From here, you can actually convert your pot odds into a percentage so you know exactly how often you need to win to break even. First, you'll have to figure out what the pot size would be if you called the bet. In this case, the total pot is $150, D and it's $50 to call, so the pot would be $200 if you call. Take this number as the final pot. Divide the size of the call by the size of the final pot. In this case, that comes out to 0.25. This means that when you call, you need to win more than 25% of the time in order to profit from the game. Talking about gambling, how could we miss out on risks and rewards? Stay with us as we talk about them next. Risk and Reward now, coming back to poker maths, we'll start off with the risk to reward ratio, which is hands down the most fundamental concept in gambling. We'll be referencing a term in this video called the break even point, which simply is the calculation of how often does a thing need to happen for the bet to be fair. From the pot odds to the bluffing frequency, anything you ask about in poker can be expressed in terms of the break even point. Elaborating on the terms, risk is anything we stand to lose when unsuccessful, while reward is anything we gain when we're successful in the game. To calculate the break even point, we use a simple formula risk divided by risk plus reward. The number you get is how much equity your hand needs to have in order to make calling break even. Once you calculate the break-even point, you can start to build intuition by estimating whether a thing happens more or less often than that. Next up, let's break down more into the basics, detailing pot odds. Poker strategy, math, pot odds. Now, whenever you are going to face bets and raises in poker, you are going to get odds. This is why you can profitably continue even if you do not rate to have the best hand at the moment. Pot odds simply compare the size of the bet you have to call to the size of the pot. They are a mathematical expression of risk and reward that can then be used to make better plays both pre-flop and post-flop. To make it simple, pot odds tend to ask what is the risk or reward in calling. So if you're facing some bet, the risk is that you would lose the money you called and the reward is that you gain both the pot and the bet. Consider this statement you hear quite often in poker. I'm getting two, one on a call. Here you are basically seeing pot odds expressed as a simplified ratio. Essentially, the number left of the colon is the reward and the number right of the colon is your risk. In the event of getting two, one on a call, you are risking one unit to win two units. Now you may have noticed how pot odds are mostly expressed as a percentage instead of ratios like this. You can take this ratio and find the break even percentage for determining profitability. Take this simple example. In the event of facing a full pot bet and getting two, one pot odds, you take one slash one plus two and see that you need at least 33% equity to continue. If your hand's equity is higher than 33%, you would continue either by calling or raising. But in case your hand's equity is lower than 33%, you would want to consider future playability and implied odds before you automatically muck your hand. Make sense? Wait up if it still doesn't, as we'll now be unfolding more about a related concept so you can understand better. Poker Strategy Math Auto Profit Our previous discussion might got you all thinking, oh, I understand how to calculate the break-even percentage, but what the heck am I supposed to do with this number? That's where we bring in the concept of auto profit, which simply compares how often you think your opponent is going to fold to the required amount of folds from the break-even percentage. A play is auto profitable when your opponent folds more often than the break-even percentage we just talked about. For instance, if you bluff for $600 into $600, your break-even percentage comes out to 50%. If you assume your opponent would fold 75% of the time against your $600 bet, then the bluff nets you an auto-profit. Simple, right? Auto-profit opportunities are everywhere, 
and they are the focal point for aggressive players. By comparing the break-even percentage to an estimation of how often your opponent will fold to a bluff, you can find extra positive EV plays in each session. This is not to say that we can only bluff if it is auto-profitable since there are other factors at play as well. Rather, by cleverly looking for auto-profit spots, we can find ways to increase our bluffing frequency in a way that is backed by math. Now, many of you might be curious to know what EV is. Stay tuned as we're heading towards that concept in the very next section. Poker Strategy Math Expected Value EV stands for Expected Value, which is another basic mathematical concept in poker. It is one of the primary focuses of anyone who is profitable in this game over years and decades. Let's make things simple. Our goal in the game is to make as many positive EV decisions as possible. The more positive EV, the better. In short, a play that is of positive expected value is more likely to net us money over the long run, while plays that are of negative expected value are going to cost us money instead. The main reason why we focus on expected values in the long term is that a single outcome does not tell the whole story. For instance, when you flip a coin, you know it will come up heads 50% of the time and tails 50% of the time. But if you flip the coin once, it will only be one of those. It would be silly to flip a coin once, have it come up heads, and walk away thinking that the result of flipping that same coin daily for the next year will be heads 100% of the time and tails 0% of the time. Yet, it's surprising how traditional players approach poker math in that exact way. What we are trying to say here is that taking a long-term view of your decisions is always a better idea. To do this with expected value or EV, you can use the following simplified formula, which means the upside of your decision minus the downside of your decision. This may sound scary to you at the moment, but don't worry. Here's an easier way to put it. Expected value is equal to how often we win, times the amount we win, minus how often we lose, times the amount we lose. Get it? There are two things to keep in mind with this formula. One, if the sum of how often we win and how often we lose is 100%, you may expect to win a pot 20% of the time, then inherently you will lose the other 80% of the time. If you know either the winning percentage or losing percentage, you can easily find the other. Two, a low winning percentage does not automatically mean that a play will be a negative EV. As long as the winning amount is a magnitude larger than the amount lost, the play could still be a positive EV. If you calculate the expected value of a play to be plus dollar 27, it means that every time you make that play, you can expect to make $27. Of course, you can make a positive EV play and still lose the pot though. Unless the losing percentage is 0%, you will not win that pot every time. But this is also why we use a bankroll. We need to be comfortable and able to risk money to make positive EV plays even if we will lose the pot at times. Since you now understand expected value, let's move on to explain the technical concepts of combos and blockers. Poker strategy, math, combos and blockers. Combos, combinations, combinatorics, they all mean the same thing. They suggest that we're looking at ranges in a somewhat calculative way and counting the ways our opponent can make certain hands. We basically try to work out how many different ways a specific hand can exist in a given situation. For instance, if you ask a new player how many combos there are of ace-king, they are likely to say one. After all, Alaska is just a single hand. But that is not how technical players look at the game. The fact is that there are 16 total combos of ace-king, which includes four suited combos and 12 unsuited combos. You just need to remember that there are six combos of every pocket pair and 16 of every unpaired hand. The 16 includes both the 12 unsuited and four suited versions. Not too scary, right? Now that you get that, you should also know that blockers and combos go hand in hand in the game. A blocker is simply a visible card that reduces the combinations of a specific hand. Since there is only one of each rank plus suit in the deck, by holding a specific card, you make it impossible for your opponents to hold hands that use that specific card. For example, if you hold the A clubs, it is impossible for your opponent to hold AK clubs. Also, if the flop is supposed jack hearts, 10 diamonds, six hearts, the jack hearts, and 10 diamonds being visible block two possible JT's combos. Most importantly, blockers are super important pre-flop as they can reduce the combos of monster starting hands. When you hold certain hands, say A5S, you reduce the possibility of your opponent holding combos of AA and AK. But keep in mind that your A5S will not eliminate all possibilities of AA and AK, but minimizing some combinations of strong starting hands can be helpful when finding extra aggression pre-flop. When it comes to blockers, there are two rules you need to remember. One, with pocket pairs, use the six, three, one, zero inches rule. This means there are six combos with zero blockers three combos if there is a single blocker, one combo if there are two blockers, and zero combos if there are three blockers. So if you hold seven, 
7. You block 0 combinations of KK, and thus, your opponent can have all 6 combos of KK. If you hold 8, 7S, they can only have 3 combos of 8. 8. If you hold AA, there is only one possible combo of AA left. 2. With unpaired starting hands, multiply together the number of unseen cards. Normally, there are 16 combos of all AK, 4 unseen aces, times 4 unseen kings. But if you have AT offsuit, you reduce their AK combos down to 12, 3 unseen aces times 4 unseen kings. If you have a hearts jack clubs, they can only have three combos of JTs, since the jack clubs 10 clubs combo is now impossible. We don't mean to say all bluffs need to be auto profitable though. A bluff that fails to be auto profitable on an earlier street can still be part of a positive EV line when factoring in future streets, playability, and edges. Let's talk more about that further in the video. Poker strategy, math, value to bluff ratio. Speaking of bluffs, you should also understand the value to bluff ratio a very handy trick that can really take your game to a whole new level. A bluff percentage is simply equal to how often you're laying pot odds, and the value percentage is just one minus this amount only on the river. Now in case that might have sounded a bit too technical, let us break it down in an easier way. First, let's define the terms. A value bet is when you believe your hand is stronger than your opponent's, and you bet to get more money into the pot. On the flip side, a bluff is when you're pretty sure your hand isn't the best, but you bet anyway hoping your opponent will fold and you'll snatch the pot without a showdown. So why balance these two? Well, if you bet only when you have a strong hand, you become too predictable. Opponents will simply fold whenever you place a big bet. Conversely, if you bluff too often, savvy players will start calling your bets more frequently and you'll lose chips fast. The key is finding the right mix that keeps opponents guessing and maximizes your profits over time. But how do you find this balance? It starts with understanding the pot odds and the odds of your bluff succeeding. Here's a simple way to think about it. If there's $100 in the pot and you bet $50, your opponent needs to call $50 to win $150. Your $50 plus the $100 already in the pot. They're getting three to one odds on their money. If their chance of having the winning hand is better than these odds, it's profitable for them to call. Suppose you think there's a 50% chance your opponent will fold to your bluff. $50 to win the $100, you risk $50. To win the $100. The simplicity of the math shows that if they fold half the time, you'll break even. Your gains when they fold will balance out your losses when they don't. Ideally, your bluffing rate should correlate with the pot odds you offer to opponents. If you're offering them 3 to 1 odds, you want them to have less than a 25% chance of calling for them to make a mistake by folding. Therefore, if you adjust your bluffing to ensure that opponents are marginally incentivized to fold rather than call, you're using the value to bluff ratio effectively. Let's say you're playing a game and you've been mostly betting with strong hands. You've noticed that your opponents have started folding to your bets more often. Now might be a good time to throw in a bluff. Since they're expecting you to have strong hands, they're more likely to fold, making your bluffs more effective. Hope that makes sense. In case it doesn't, feel free to drop your questions in the comments below. Bluffing frequency and value. Betting. Based on the pot odds you've offered 4.5. 1. Your opponent needs to win 22% of the time to break even, which indirectly influences how often you should bluff versus how often you should bet for value. If your bluffing frequency is higher than this threshold, it might not be sustainable as observant opponents could adjust and call more often. In the example above, Adjusting your bluff frequency to occasionally mix in strong hands or bluff less frequently can help maintain a perfect balance, making your strong bets more credible and your bluffs more effective. To become a successful player, it is essential to have a solid understanding of the poker strategy math concepts that underpin the game. This approach not only guides you through individual hands, but also helps build a solid overall strategy, enhancing your gameplay by making it more difficult for opponents to read and predict your moves. In case you found this video helpful, don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more insightful poker tips. We'll be back with a new update real soon. Thanks for tuning in.